several aspects of with different vectors we discussed about uh, about the cosmid we discussed about why should there be a cost site and what is the advantage of it i mean it is essential for packaging why do we want to package in the page particles because we want to efficient introduction of the recombinant dna into the bacterium because the larger size the larger the size less efficient it would become then we discussed about single stranded dna the m13 phage and we have discussed the biology of it and the advantages it is somewhere around 5 kb it's you can just isolate it as if you are doing plasmid isolation and then the that it is it can be very long there are no space constraints like you have a capsid with a stretch in geometry whereas in this one it is lengthwise if it has to be longer you you probably have to generate these enveloped virus and then why do we want single stranded in the first place there are several reasons one of it is for sequencing the other one is for making probes in blotting techniques and for site directed metagenesis we have better ways of doing things right now but still it's it is important that we learn because these principles can be applicable in many other um many other techniques or your problems that will come that you are supposed to solve transcriptional fusions uh, translational fusions and in translational fusion there would not be a stop codon here there should be read in frame continuous so that the amino acid uh, residues or the sequence the primary structure of and x will remain same without any alterations there will there should not be any frame shifts and uh, yes we are sir yes yes i understand the network is gone okay so i hope uh, can you see my screen everything is fine i just connected to my hotspot yes sir screen is visible sir uh, i think you were explaining that uh, yes on somewhere in the transcription something and then that uh, use of lambda yes, uh, yes. somewhere their uh, voice got cut sir okay okay that's all right so anyway uh, just review of uh, previous class yes so if there are any proteins that are small toxic or unstable their expression usually is very less and you cannot usually get them in large quantities for further characterization in such situations making translational fusion usually helps so when you make them then you can generate a fusion protein something like this and then that you can use um, to cleave a, cleave or you can also sometimes study directly as well but often it's not uh, the functions of the small proteins or the target protein that we are trying to look at may be compromised so we should have engineered a a cleavage site in this place which can be cleaved by a certain uh, protease and then we can get uh, separate these two proteins and then isolate the protein of our interest and then use it for further characterization then we were discussing about phage display and today i would like to continue with that to start with what is phage display and that is to do with uh, translational fusions as well so i will just um, quickly uh, brush once again um, 
and discuss what is a translational fusion uh, sorry phage display when you say phage display we want the protein of our interest displayed on the phage okay we want the display of the protein like this that is called phage display if we want to do this we should have chosen a our construct our genome uh, the genetic construct that we have to or recombinant dna that we should have made should have the the phage uh, protein sorry i will put it as red to indicate uh, i am trying to indicate this protein there is a phage protein right that is on the surface so i would want that phage protein there this is sur phage surface protein something like spike proteins you might have heard from about covid uh, ones there they would have spike proteins for example or capsid protein and we would want to make a translational fusion of a gene of interest okay and this is a translational fusion that meaning here we would have had a promoter this would be there would be a ribosome binding site and we would have a start codon here and then this is a continuous reading frame without any obstructions or interruptions and then we would have had a stop codon here okay they should be cloned in frame the gene of interest should be cloned in frame with the phage this is uh, because we are putting so let's see when a protein is produced then the protein will have will be something like this or i will put it as linearized ones so this is the protein i'm linearizing it and then we have the pro the followed by translational fusion of the gene of interest and that will eventually fold into something like this okay i'm just talking this is protein in linear ones so this would be the N-terminus of protein. Proteins are always discussed from N-terminus to C-terminus, amino-terminus to carboxyl terminus. So this is N-terminal fusion, isn't it? Because we put the gene of the phage gene here. On the N-terminus of gene of interest, we have the phage protein, um, phage gene, and because of, because of which the product will be that the protein uh, this part of it is phage protein and this is of our gene of interest you can also do it the other way around where you where we could have constructed um, we could have constructed the reverse way wherein we can have our gene of interest first and then so this is the promoter we could have made the gene of interest here and followed by the phage protein okay or the capsid protein so in that case you we would have the protein we would get something like this so you can talk talk of it as um, c terminal fusion the, the name is not the point but you should know that there are both the both are possible okay and now we are going to try to see if how it can be used and let's see here is a protocol i'm not going into delve into the protocol itself but it's a good um, but we will try to understand some concepts of phage display using this uh, protocol here first thing i would as usual would want you to appreciate what is the construct every time you are looking at a vector you should see what is the construct how it is there what are the elements that are present and only then you can know what it is. As usual, the first one that we have is call E1. That is an origin of replication for E. coli. Everywhere, anytime you're reading a paper and there is a vector or a gene construct, you take it and try to know what they are. And that is when we probably will understand uh, more and better things. Then this is ampicillin resistance, that is beta-lactamase. F1 origin is to generate a single-stranded DNA. 
it's a promoter that will result in formation of single stranded dna and there are there is lac promoter which can be induced by using iptg isopropyl thiogalactoside and it is a gratuitous indu inducer i hope you know what it is gratuitous inducer which means it's an inducer that normally lacoprone uh, the inducer is allolactose lactose right we'll just say it as lactose will will act as a co-activator also or inducer and will allow the production of beta galactosidase which will degrade lactose right this lactose that induced and other lactose that has been brought into the cell so the lactose that is present here is getting consumed in the process isopropyl thiogalactoside is a gratuitous inducer meaning that it does not get consumed that means beta cal cannot act on iptg but iptg can bind um, to activators and act as co-activator and allow the expression from or induction from lac promoter and then we have um, a dna or this is where you can probably clone the dna this is from a paper so it could be the, the gene that they are they were working with and then we have a h6 uh, his tag his tag that is nothing but you have you must have learned in um, in protein purification or downstream processing and other techniques where it is his tag is simple you have continuous uh, i just put it as h h six of them six histidines this is useful for affinity chromatography during separation why histidines they can they have imidazole ring they can bind to nickel ions so we can use a stationary phase uh, with uh, nickel ions and then any protein that has the his tag when you allow it those that do not have it those that do not have his tag will pass through while the proteins with the his tag will bind and will be retained within the column okay then you can wash and elute to get it. okay and then i think this is the gp3 uh, g3p fragment i'm i'm unsure but i would assume right now it is as as cell surface protein but ompe is also a cell surface protein outer membrane protein so in, in i'm not sure uh, i'm not going into the complete exact protocol these people have used but it's a nice way to learn many things that are involved in this so we make gene library construct in this okay and when we make the gene library construct and then what we will do is we will transform it into e coli when i say gene library construct in this what are the steps that might have been involved here we would have taken the genomic dna from um, or cdna we will discuss about cdna libraries in a later stage so we'll take cdna libraries and then we would have um, cloned them we would have constructed i mean that means we would have taken mrna we will discuss about uh, cdna libraries don't worry about it we'll take mrna make a complementary dna of it double stranded complementary dna and then we will clone within this site then we have diverse recombinant molecules. In some cases, you may have um, gene A cloned in there. In some cases, gene B, gene C, and so on. It is a library trying to mostly representing the, it is a cDNA library. So we will then transform into E. coli. Um, and then using E. coli, when we do that, we will get several transformants and the transformants should be made into i mean we we are talking about phage display right we want phages to be made and then we use a helper phage because the dna that we have here 
will the SSF from here, the F1 origin of replication, you can generate a single stranded DNA. Say if it is M13 phage, then we, we want a single stranded DNA. And using that, we will make uh, we will make that. We can the the vector has only the information to make to clone the gene of interest to make a translational fusion with the his his six uh, x. But there is nothing to code for the phage phage head particles and other things. It has origin of replication and other things, so replication would have happened. It will only produce the DNA. There are no genes for formation of the phages. So there should be phage, helper phages are infected to this E. coli transformants. And using them, the helper phage is modified such that it doesn't replicate much uh, or it doesn't produce the genome, but only produces excess, excessively produces all the proteins required for the formation of phages. In that case, the phages will form, and this the DNA would get um, cloned into them. And when they express, I mean, this cell will produce phages of this one, the one that is uh, blue in color here, right? Because of that is present, the phage. And when the phage organizes, it will form phages with displayed proteins on top of them. Okay, that is phage display. So phage display libraries can be used for multiple purposes as is being used here. We will not go into the details right now because our focus right now, actually as a part of this lesson, we are discussing about vectors. How a vector can be used to generate, uh, use them in the phage display. But roughly, you have generated now a phage library. Here it was just, uh, say, bacterial uh, cDNA library. Now you have phage library with phages displaying on their surface the proteins. We can now check which proteins bind to a target. And we add all these phage libraries and wash away the rest. Those that did not bind will get washed away. Those that, that bind to the target will be retained. And then you elute it and you analyze what DNA is present in the in the phages, and then you will find out what all genome, which genes are. Then you can further evolve them um, by through through several rounds of mutagenesis to generate higher binding uh, with binding with higher affinity. Okay, but I hope the point of at this uh, point we are trying to learn about the vector. That is the focus. Okay, so we are supposed to still look at several vectors. They will come, uh, we will discuss about them at certain points when we have to uh, solve some problems. So right now, that, that is why it is important to roll. I'm trying to describe why the elements that are present in, in this particular vector called PGM, 3Z. Origin of replication, for replication within E. coli. And BLA is uh, beta lactamase or ampicillin resistance gene. And lag Z, you remember, uh, because we were using something called alpha complementation, right? For that is useful for blue white screening. And the interesting one thing is if you are cloning, if you cloned something here, you can segregate based on blue white screening which one is um, which one is a recombinant and which one is not a recombinant. And one important consideration that we should have when we are doing using a a, a lag Z based or alpha complementation based um, selection process. Or screening process, so it's a selection or screening. Sorry, in that case, we should have taken the host. Host should be um, the lac prime, lac Z prime, meaning that it has a truncated or mutant. We will just put it as 
it is called as uh, also m13 fragment or so there is a phage the e coli should be lack z uh, we'll put it as this which means it does not produce a complete or functional lag z when you use a vector that is having a lag z um, alpha fragment then if then you can use it as recombinant if you have by mistake taken wild type e coli which can produce a functional functional lag z or beta galactosidase then you will not be able to use effectively the blue white screening okay so that is one consideration we should have so one another thing one important uh, as as usual we have multiple cloning site there are so many of these uh, unique restriction sites within the cloning and that is in the lag set there are two promoters one of it is t7 promoter the other one is sp6 promoter i will try to linear put it in linear wise here it goes the t7 promoter and here we have sp6 uh, sorry sp6 promoter both these t7 and sp6 promoters are are phage rna polymerases are phage promoters some phages have their own rna polymerase gene as well so these rna polymerases can recognize only that their particular promoters their specific sequences and they are dif different from what the e coli promoters are okay so they all all the interactions between promoter and rna polymerase is eventually about sequence specificity so this rna polymerase of the phage say for example we will call it as t7 rna polymerase or sp6 rna polymerase of these are of phage in origin they recognize only t7 polymer rna polymerase only recognizes t7 promoter and if t7 rna polymerase is not present there will not be any transcription from t7 similarly the case with sp6 as well you should have somewhere in the genome expressing sp6 rna polymerase only then sp6 is uh, will allow the transcription from this promoter and then we will have the genes so before going further i would want to i want you to recollect some things when we have transcription and this is the promoter and we say this is somewhere around here we have the start codon atg and here tga the complementary strand would have been tac and act right <laughs> how do you describe these strands which one is the coding strand which one is the non coding strand say if the mrna is produced okay if mrna is produced it would have been it would the sequence that it's supposed to have is atg and tga mrna is referred to as plus strand because it contains the open reading frame mrna is also uh, always transcription everything always is read from 5 prime to 3 prime that we know it so it is called the plus strand it is called you can also call it as the coding strand i use this convention so that it's easy for me to figure out how to name these two strands you can also call it as sense strand okay i mean this is a uh, basic what you may have learned already so i just wanted for the benefit of everyone to see if we can try to understand these two so the top strand is plus strand because it is identical to that of the mrna right it is also the it is the plus strand it is the coding strand it is the sense strand but it's not the template
for transcription to occur to produce mrna like this the template strand should have been the bottom one only then we would be able to rna polymerase would be able to generate mrna with the code with the open reading frame in proper order orientation so uh, this the lower strand in this case is the minus strand it is the non coding strand it is the antisense and it is the template template refers to transcription during transcription the lower strand actually acts as the template to produce sequence the complementary sequence which is the mrna right so i hope uh, you got this right time erasing this and i'll try to continue so here what i want you to also rem uh, remember is okay i'll use this surface here so assume this one there are two promoters right this one is t7 promoter the other one is sp6 promoter if t7 promoter is active we will get one mrna like we discussed this is from t7 and that will produce atg tga kind of mrna if sp6 is active it will produce a, um, the sequence, the mRNA for this. Here I'm writing, this would be the five prime because it's going in the reverse. Here it is three prime to five prime. So having two, the, the question here is why should we have two promoters and why are they in the opposite orientation in this, in PGM? That is the question I'm trying to address. So say, for example, uh, I'll use this. There are multiple purposes for it, especially some of one of it is to generate single standard probes, single standard RNA for uh, to generate probes for during um, northern blotting. We'll get to what is northern blotting later. So we want to generate radioactive um, radioactive probes, and in that case, we would want we this kind of arrangement is good. There is also another way. So sometimes, say for example, we didn't have restriction endonucleases, multiple of them, or we are unable to clone the gene in particular orientation. In in one case, assume that the gene that we have cloned Co cloned may get possible like this or in another one in another case it's not possible to clone in that orientation only this orientation is or the opposite orientation is possible in that case it would be nice to have a promoter on the other side like this upstream of the open reading frame right so if I say, for example, this is T7, and on the other side, I have um, SP6, and here is T7 and SP6. In this case, if I could, if I could clone the gene of interest in this orientation, I would have used T7 RNA polymerase, and then I would get the actual mRNA produced, and then the protein also. If I could not and could only clone it in the opposite direction, then I can use SP6 RNA polymerase to get proper expression of this gene. Okay, these are the two advantages of having a construct, a vector such as this one. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask so that I'll try to see, I'll see if I can explain it in a different way. But otherwise, um, it should be straightforward. But feel free, no issues. OK. There are several other vectors. Um, we are now shifting from bacterial vectors to that of eukaryotic vectors. 
And here we are talking about an east episomal vector. We should know what is an episome. For every word that comes in any of your biology things or in general, know the meanings of it. Then it's easy for you to understand. If we have a cell, and especially episome is the word associated with um, something in the nucleus, okay, these are assumed these are the chromosomes and everything. And a separate entity exists independent of the genome within the nucleus. You can, it is called as um, episome. Okay, it does not integrate, the episome stays outside. I mean, it's not integrated physically or into the genome of the host cell. That is an episome. So all DNA where expression should happen, this is also important because we are talking about eukaryotes. Unlike in bacteria, in bacteria, transcription, translation, everything happens in the same cell, within the same compartment, because there is no internal compartment uh, compartmentation like that of nucleus or endoplasmic reticulum and so on. You don't have those intracellular organelles, much of them. So, but in eukaryotes, nucleus is the place where replication occurs, where transcription occurs, right? And translation occurs in the cytoplasm. Any Anything that we, any vector that we are making should have been in the nucleus to start with so that it, it gets replicated and it also gets transcribed because eventually if you are already raising, trying to use it uh, yeast as a host, that means you have special, special needs to learn about the gene that you are cloning or see its function and so on. So it should be in the nucleus and it is not integrated, then you call it as episome. So there are other things that we need to know. First thing, we cannot die. We don't usually work directly in yeast or any other organism in general. The majority, the workhorse of recombinant DNA technology is E. coli. And that is, a majority of the protocols are optimized for E. coli for gene manipulation. Any manipulation, um, such as say you want to increase, you want to ligate two different DNA and then and increase the number by transformation, E. coli does all that for us. We use E. coli all the time. So and but eventually we want to study the the nature of or the function of the gene in yeast. Say that then we have to be able to have a vector that can replicate and transcribe even in yeast, right? The most important is as any DNA is a genetic information if it is associated with the origin of replication. If there is no origin of replication, that DNA is probably just DNA, right? So if what if you have a plasmid here and you just put it here, it will not multiply along with the yeast. Only one cell might have taken up and that is the one copy. We don't know how long it will be there and then how long it will exist and then maybe eliminate it. So we have to work with two different organisms. One is with E. coli and the other one is yeast. So we need two origin of replications. One origin of replication is for East, uh, sorry, E. coli. This will allow the multiplication of the vector within E. coli. And then we have two mu m origin, that's a small origin from East that will allow the uh, existence of the, the vector or replication of the vector within yeast. So there are two, two origin of replications. But we also need one other thing is selectable marker. One of it for E. coli is beta-lactamase. 
and we cannot use the same beta lactamase in yeast beta lactamase is useful or it inhibits the formation of peptidoglycan and so bacterial cell walls are made up of peptidoglycan whereas yeast cell walls yeast is a fungus and it is made up of chitin so beta lactamase cannot really work in yeast so we need to have a selection a separate selection marker for uh, for yeast and that is where we are using trip one there are many things that we need to discuss about it we discussed about what is an episome we discussed about what is a shuttle vector in the sense you are working with e coli and it is also uh, usable in yeast you can take from here and put it here you can take from here and put it here that is called basically a shuttle vector it depends on our needs but the ability to grow in two different organisms you can call them as shuttle vector so the shuttle vector would have two origin of replication it will have two selectable markers if you in microbiology or so or in molecular biology if you learnt about mutagenesis you must have gone through something uh, you must have read ames test i'm not going to talk about ames test but there you should have encountered what is an oxotrop and what is a prototrop so first to start with this prototrop means you can kind of take it as wild type it is isolated from the nature that means if it is able to grow in nature that means it has all the genes required to survive in nature nature is harsh nature is changing and then you there is if any organism is able to survive in this harsh conditions and ever changing harsh conditions then it should have had many different genes that are responsible that can allow its survival okay so those organisms here are called as prototrop okay and what is an oxotrop oxotrop is it can grow but you have to take a little care some care is required that means you have it is it's not having all the genes okay somewhere some deficiency is there some genes might be missing say for example we'll take e coli e coli can grow in I, i will do i will change it it's not e coli because we want to talk about yeast so we will talk about talk it as an example yeast prototrop if you take that means which can grow by itself in nature has all the genes if i give um if i give defined media okay just components i don't want i don't give amino acids to it i give compounds from which compounds and an energy source for the yeast to generate its own amino acids okay and a prototrop which when i said prototrop which can actually grow by itself will be able to survive and multiply when that but yeast oxotrop and oxotrop means if i put it on this kind of um, a minimal media okay defined you can call it as minimal media which means that you have given basic compounds from which and energy source carbon source all the sources all the elements are present there is some energy as well in the form of glucose for example and then the yeast should be able to synthesize all the amino acids all the nucleic acids proteins everything from there and then grow and survive survive and multiply that is when it is successful if you take yeast oxotrop that means it has a deficiency right oxotrop means it is a deficient one assume that it is deficient in making tryptophan um tr one second please
tryptophan amino acid. That means it can provide, it can, it has all the genes except somewhere because of a mutation, it cannot produce tryptophan. Tryptophan is an important amino acid. Every amino acid is an important one. And cells need this uh, all amino acids to make different variety or diverse proteins. And if they are not present, even if one is missing, the cells will fail to grow. If you put these cells in minimal media, then they cannot grow. But if you have supplemented this minimal media with tryptophan, then it can start growing. Okay, so that is what is meant by oxotrop. Oxotrop is almost prototrop, except that it may have had some mutation somewhere because of which it cannot uh, produce, uh, cannot survive on minimal media unless it is supplemented with what it is deficient for. It is deficient to make amino acid tryptophan. So if you supply it, it can absorb and then grow and multiply. Okay, I hope you understood what is oxotrop and prototrop. In AMIS test, you use uh, to test the potency of a mutagen, the reversal and so on. So uh, what I'm going to do now is, um, I'll erase this. What I'm going to now show you how uh, this is used as a selectable marker. You should have taken East Oxotrop, and I will put it as, when you say East Oxotrop, it is TRP minus. That means it cannot synthesize tryptophan. This is the host that you're taking. This is the host cell that you're taking. And if you say, assume you are cloning your gene and then you want to use it in E. coli, you have, you have made a clone, a recombinant DNA, you made it in E. coli. And there you have done transformation. You added these here and you did transformation. This is E. coli. Okay. And then you will grow it on nutrient agar with ampicillin because we are using ampicillin resistance gene as a selectable marker. So the one that forms colonies is likely the um, is likely the transformant. Those are the transformants. And then now I want to test. I, I would have figured out which ones are recombinant and which ones are non-recombinant by any other procedures that we have discussed previously. Then. I want to now use it, uh, test the, the recombinant in yeast. How is it working and so on. So I should have transfer, isolated the plasmid or episomal vector and then transformed it into yeast and see what happens. I should have grown the, the transformation this mixture of cells with minimal media plus supplemented with tryptophan and then which all there are two different types of cells right i will just um, get back one second okay you are now taking yeast and then you have taken yeast and uh, which is trip oxotropic for tryptophan and you have done transformation so you'll get two types of cells cells that are transformants that means they have taken up the dna and non transformants if i gave if i allow Mm, one second. Which of these cells are likely to grow on these plates, on minimal media plates? Anybody? Non transformants and transformants. Anyone? The transformants, yes, please. Transformants. transformants. Yes. Why is that? 
because they already form in very small numbers anyway. Mm, yes. So now, which ones will grow on the min on minimal media is the question. So the vector has the tryptophan gene. This is the functional gene to produce tryptophan. The non-transformants, which did not get the plasmid, are still trip minus. They cannot produce tryptophan. Yes, so transformants okay. actually are the one sponsor because since they yes. had the and uh, since they have the tryptophan one gene right. in order to produce yes. tryptophan. So I right. wanted to add that also. Okay, good. Thank you. So in non-transformants, the trip to the host cell, as I said, is trip minus. That means they cannot survive unless you supplement the medium with tryptophan. So the non-transformants still remain trip minus, because of which they will fail to grow on minimal media. Whereas the transformants, they have acquired the plasmid or the episomal vector, from which the trip one and gene is expressed and enzyme is produced because of which they are trip plus now even if the, the minimal media the, even if it is not supplied it can grow and that is how these markers are used okay and i have uh, i'll just touch upon this one and i will stop so this is another similar one except this is not a episomal vector the is different in the sense that it stays in the nucleus and its replication may be independent of the chromosome and some of the when the cell divides in some cases the episome may not be maintained with that some of the cells may not may lose the um, episome that means in a population the stability may not be very high not that all the population will always have episome okay this is for other practical purposes so we want to have something like this a cell is there and it has dna one chromosome or so and we want to have when the cell divides we want very faithful segregation of the dna to both the cells what makes it happen is the centromere. Because what is the centromere typically in chromosomes? This is centromere. That is where the kinetochore is organized to which the spindle fibers bind. And when you have two copies, sister chromatids attached like this, each one is segregated to the daughter cells, right? So they have engineered a um, centromere in here so that when the cell divides, it can be faithfully segregated. It increases the population, in, increases the presence of the, um, this vector within the cells. So that is the importance of adding centromere. ARS, you know, ap at autonomous replicating system, whereas autonomously replicating sequence or so, which is and uh, similar to the origin of replication in yeast in chrome in humans and uh, in eukaryotes you have multiple origin of replications unlike in the bacterial ones so this is everything is almost same except you have an addition of centromere and the ars is similar to that of what would have been present in yeast uh, yeast chromosomal origin of replication they have added it so every time the chromosome replicates, this one will also replicate. Every time the chromosome is uh, during anaphase, they would have separated and be segregated to opposite poles. Because of the centromere reason, uh, re sequence, the same thing will happen to this east centromere vector as well. OK? So I hope you understand the importance of how strong our biology should be there to be able to understand the uh, recombinant DNA to start with and be able to uh, be in a situation where we can apply them in our own purposes. If you are going to be in research in biology, then you have to be, uh, you should become very competent and 
uh, very competent with basic biologies to start with, especially molecular biology and cell biology, and then be able to know how all all the ways in which these genetic tools can be manipulated to design novelties, novel uh, vectors or designs, so that you can achieve your goal. Okay. So please try to pay attention, try to have a look and come back um, and ask me if you have any questions. I'll try my best to answer. OK? I'll stop here. In the next class, we will discuss a few more uh, vectors, and then we will move on to further. Any questions? Anybody? Uh, any questions with regard to CAA, CAA paper? If you have, I would also like to answer them. Maybe I will send a, a scheme of evaluation or the key key to the question paper, very simple way, so that you you will know if you got it right or if there is any problem in there. Okay, take care and uh, have lots of fun. Bye-bye.